Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, today we're going to talk on about this really cheerful topic, uh, fear of death. Mm-hmm. And I have been wanting to talk about this topic for a while because I've actually had a number of analyzans who came into treatment with this as a major focus. So these were, these were you know, kind of younger people, kind of, you know, early middle age maybe, uh, who just found that a pervasive uh, kind of rumination about death was holding them back and uh, contributing to kind of underlying anxiety that maybe manifested as panic attacks or just in general created other problems. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's a really interesting subject clinically. I'm, a, I'm sure I'm not the only clinician uh, having these kinds of issues walk into the consulting room. And then, of course, I was really interested to see what Jung had to say about it. And in fact, he has quite a lot to say. So let's uh-huh. begin our circumambulation. Yeah. Well, of course, I, I can add the obvious, which is fear of death is part of the human condition. Uh, it, it's always there, you know, um, especially if one has a, a difficult or life-threatening illness. Um, we're all aware of people, young people, who uh, through injury or accident are, are taken from life way before uh, their expected time. And of course, you know, as we age, uh, and death is closer and closer, uh, what Jung calls the afternoon of life and the evening of life, um, we ha- we have to face it more more consciously. Uh, so there it is, um, part of the human condition. I find in my own work that it's important to make a distinction when people say that they have a fear of death. Many times they have a fear of suffering, they have a fear of illness, Mm. they have a fear of decrepitude, they have a fear of injury, they have Mm -hmm. a fear of loss of beauty, loss of attractiveness, loss of capacity. And unfortunately, many of those things are rolled into the concept of fear of death, but they're all very, very different, and they require different stances different processes of consideration. So if we're going to look at the specific idea of the idea of the cessation of life of the body, um, and, and that particular thing, which I actually find uh, particularly rare among my analysands, uh, they more often have a fear of illness or a fear of pain uh, that's mm-hmm. being expressed by fear of death. But this idea of the cessation of me in all, in all ways and the fear that um, somehow I, I will mm-hmm. simply go into a void. To, that, that's quite a unique thing. You know, thing. the overarching... Oh. The, the overarching uh, heading for all that you've just said, is anxiety. Uh, Anxiety over all kinds of things, of what will happen to me that I may not have uh, control over. And uh, there's a man named Ernest Becker who wrote a book that I think was on the bestseller list many years ago called Denial of Death. And he posits that uh, our basic anxiety, if you trace everything else back to a taproot, uh, is our terror of death. And so uh, it may be that a given person is 
afraid of losing his job or, you know, any one of a number of other fears like the ones you just named, Joseph. But that underneath that is um, the fear of not not existing, the fear of loss of control, that there are things I don't have control over. So we encapsulate things. We uh, project things onto other people. We uh, displace our fear of death onto other life issues. Uh, but that, that at root, that is part of, as I said before, the human condition. Yeah, and and just to respond to what you said, Joseph, uh, you know, I I do have folks. I have worked with folks who what what terrifies them is that sense of ceasing to exist, of just that sense of the mm-hmm. void. And and Deb, I think yeah. you know that's an interesting way to think about it. That the taproot of all fear is the the terror, this existential fear of non-existence. Mm-hmm. So if you think about, well, I'm nervous to go, I'm, you know, I'm anxious to go to the party tonight because I don't know that many people and who will I talk to? It's like, well, what would be so bad about that? Well, I might be uh, terribly embarrassed mm-hmm. and humiliated. Well, what would be so bad about that? Well, then maybe I wouldn't have any friends. Well, what would be so bad about that? Well, then when I needed some help, <laughs> it wouldn't mm-hmm. be there. And, you know, you can sort of just roll it all the way back eventually. Yes. To, right. And then I might die. So in some, <laughs> in some ways, it is the er fear. That does yes. underlie anxiety. And, and, and I want to respond, uh, Deb, also to what you said. Like, I think you both were, were, were kind of getting at this. You know, there is a substantial difference become, between a very sort of neurotic fear of death, which comes upon us earlier in life and mm-hmm. trips us up and makes it difficult for us to live, versus uh, a much more grounded kind of fear of death that we might face when we're either beset by, you know, terrible illness or perhaps, you know, in the moments before a terrifying car accident or, or just even at the end of life, when, when we're actually looking at something that has a sense of immediacy to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think those two things function differently in the psyche and, and probably require a different response as well. Well, I, I find myself thinking about the way that the psyche prepares for death. I think about the end of life experiences that I observed when I was working as a medical social worker in a burn trauma unit. And that when the soul and the body are both longing for release, then the relationship to death is quite different than than death comes in the way that the ancient Greeks thought of Persephone as the mistress of death. Where death would come in a kind of winter garb, and in the last moment, lift her veil to show the face of the laughing maiden wreathed in spring flowers. And so death comes sometimes in the longed for release, in the embrace and the promise that some kind of laying down of suffering is promised. And so it's not uncommon for us to, well, I think of some of my uh, grandparents talking about looking forward to death, looking forward to Mm. the embrace, looking forward to to not waking up and being in in terrible pain all the time, or not Mm -hmm. continuing to, to miss all of one's friends, to feel that all, everyone that one knows is on the other side, somewhere waiting for them. And so death, or the image of death, can present itself so differently depending on the the psyche's orientation to the end of life. Conversely, when the death impulse or the death image comes 
to us too soon, let's say in a suicidal fantasy or in a terrible threatening illness that happens to a young person, then death comes as a monster that is, that is pursuing mm-hmm. us, and we are running with all of our strength to escape its claws, not because death is evil, but because it is premature. Then the yes. psyche is, is unprepared. It is the wrong season. Death shouldn't come in springtime, and death mm-hmm. shouldn't come in the middle of the summertime. That's the wrong time. And the imagery and the feeling around it then uh, highlights the the wrongness of it. Yeah. I think that's such an important point of, uh, for all of us who've been, you know, connected in some way uh, with people who have been taken too young at the wrong time in the springtime of their life or the summer of their life, uh, that it can feel to those of us who remain uh, uh, like death is a trauma. You know, I'm especially thinking of uh, clients that I have had whose parents died when they were very, very young. You know, so here's somebody who lost her mother when she was five or somebody who lost a father when he was 12. And so the early experience with death is that it it was traumatizing for that child or young person. And it and it does feel from a subjective point of view like it was just wrong. You know, my parent was not supposed to die at age say 35. Uh, that this is not the right rhythm. It's not the right time. Uh, it's not how things are, quote, supposed to be, unquote. You know, uh, versus the sadness of watching a grandparent die who has, one hopes, lived a full life. And it's, there's sadness, but it doesn't feel wrong the way early death can feel. So so wanting to really focus on fear of death, though, I I want to take what you've both been saying and and maybe kind of look at this phenomenon of either early or late in life becoming Mm -hmm. beset by a fear that paralyzes us. So one particular example that I find, and I'm, I am personally aware of this. In fact, Deb, I have, a, I have a very fond memory of you in regards to this that maybe you don't remember, of um, how <laughs> afraid I was of my own death when my children were small. Yes. I mean, I was terrified. I, honestly, I, I used to have to drive an hour to go to analysis, and every single time I did that, I was so anxious. And, and it yeah. wasn't rational. It's not like I was thinking, oh, well, if I die, my kids will be motherless. It was visceral. And it, it, was, um, it was almost paralyzing. It was, it was um, I, mm-hmm. I almost developed a, a kind of phobia of driving during that period. And, and mm-hmm. I have found this with other mothers of young children, that there is this kind of uh, um, real yeah. fear that happens. And Deb, I, here's the story. Uh, you had spent the night at my house and the next morning we were getting on a plane to go to Boulder to take uh, our exams. Oh and I, we were so anxious anyway, because we were going to take these bloody exams. But I also <laughs> was so afraid to fly because my kids were, they were like three and five or something like that. They were tiny. And I, you came down the stairs and I said something like, um, something about being afraid to fly. And you just looked at me with a knowing smile and you said, it's always worse when our kids are little. And it was so relieving because you, you got it, you got it. And it it was very containing to have that scene. So I I think it's probably normal and adaptive for mothers to have uh, a heightened fear of their own death when their children are small, it's interesting. It's almost mm-hmm. like the biology sort of accounts for that. And it's like, hey, mom, you better not die. These, these kids really need you. 
Um, so, yeah. and, and that, you know, again, for me, it was, it was painful and almost debilitating. It was, I had to fight against the fear of getting in the car, especially for longer car rides. Mm. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, but this can beset any of us at a, at a time in our lives when it's not really appropriate. And what do we, what do we, what, how do we understand that, that fear of death that kind of keeps us, mm -hmm. that can be paralyzing? I, I, before I move on to that, um, what you've just related is really, uh, it just touches me and, uh, took me back to remembering my own young motherhood and the feeling that I had to be there at every moment and that somehow my presence was protective. Um, you know, even to go out for a night, get a babysitter, you know, what if something happened to me? What if something happened to them? Uh, so it takes me back to just a, a felt appreciation for how painful and very real and very visceral that fear of death can be. Uh, so it's not just a topic. It's a lived experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, for many, if not most of us. Well, and I've I, certainly seen it. Oh, go ahead, Joseph. It's okay. Go ahead. You you had seen it in some places. No, no. You go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> you go ahead. I'll hang. I'll hang on to mine. You go ahead. Um, I I was thinking about just the early psychoanalytic thought around this because. For Jung, rather, excuse me, for Freud, this idea of eros and thanatos was a big topic, that love and death, or eros and death, were polarities. And so much of what, or how Freud conceptualized the psychoanalytic um, venture was to help people orient towards eros, towards the love of life, the zest of work, towards family and connection, and that anything that was anti-eros, in a sense, was part of the death instinct. And the death instinct was, in large part, driven by loss and alienation and withdrawal. So just to put that on the table, that again, from the psychoanalytic theory, that the fear of death was connected to early childhood experiences, and particularly the first time that the child experiences a loss of a loved object in, in any of its mm -hmm. forms, whether it's that the, the beloved pet has, uh, has passed away, or sometimes even a beloved relative moved away, uh, a friend goes mm -hmm. and leaves and is now in another country, that from an archetypal standpoint to the child, it the loss of the object permanence, the loss of the object becomes the first experience of death, that there's something that, that I rely on that is removed from my presence, and I have no control over that. So the beginning is that loss of the loved one or the fear of being abandoned. And being abandoned is, in a certain sense, the mirror side of that, that I have fallen into the realm of the forgotten by having been mm. abandoned, that in a sense, I am now a ghost. I am less alive, or I am deadened mm -hmm. from having been abandoned. Mm -hmm. So the concept of death is often introduced to the child just through loss, and that this early experience mm -hmm. of loss begins to create a feeling in the child of their own mortality and the mortality of others. 
So that's that's one theory about where this begins to percolate. Now this is normal, but sometimes if that process of negotiating with the normal sense of loss is impaired or gets caught in a kind of complex, then it can grow into something that doesn't feel normal or begins to be overwhelming. So Mm -hmm. separation anxiety can feed into a death complex Mm -hmm. that can grow into this internalization of fear that then comes in later on in life. It doesn't sound like, oh, I'm I'm afraid of separation or afraid of being abandoned. But it infests other less appropriate images in the psyche. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about uh, going on the plane as a young mother and there's a fear of death, Another way that that could be thought of is, is um, separation anxiety. That mm-hmm. I would be separated from my beloved children mm-hmm. um, because of, let's say, my death or even just the idea of death. But the real mm-hmm. issue is that they would be over there and I wouldn't be able to reach them. And I would be trapped over on the other side. And how intolerable it would be to be separated from your babies. Um, that, that would be an awful thing. But it shows up as a fear of death. Mm-hmm. I wonder, in a way, if we're circling around uh, absence uh, and what we do when something is absent that we really need, a proximity to our children, um, the death of a loved one, uh, the loss of, you know, what we in psych speak call the transitional object of you leave home and, uh, uh-oh, we forgot Bobby's teddy bear. And nobody realized it and it's too late. We can't go back and get it. But that it's absence of something that I need. And some absences, uh, a child, a teen, an adult, Uh, we can integrate it, we can adapt to it, we can mourn it, we can uh, somehow come to terms with it. And some absences, if they're premature or or really traumatic, uh, we, we can't come to terms with. But I think at the crux of it, it is coming to terms with an absence. The beloved thing is not there, and It cannot be restored. Uh, Maybe, but but I think I want to, I don't want to make death about anything. I'm feeling reluctant to make death about something other than death, because it is the sort of final mystery that we all have to somehow countenance. And uh, I I love the fact that you brought up, uh, both of you, the kind of childhood uh, beginnings of it, because uh, you know, there is an age that kids are when they many of them will go through a kind of um, keen interest in death. And I think it's a I'm just trying to remember when I think it was like four or five when when my kids did. And, you know, they they're always asking about every time you pass a cemetery, <laughs> they're very interested in that. And they're <laughs> fairly curious about mm-hmm. that. And they're asking, am I going to die? Or are you going to die with some anxiety, but also a lot of curiosity? And, and, you know, it's like a mm-hmm. character in a book dies and they're really curious about that and, and maybe a little upset. And I think sometimes parents are too protective and it's like, oh, I'm not going to let them watch the first few minutes of, uh, what is that movie about the fish? Oh, shoot. Um, I can't remember. Anyway, the Disney, no, the Pixar movie with the fish, Sa- Nemo, something Nemo. about Nemo. Anyway. <laughs> That's not the full title, but anyway, um, or, or, you know, so many, so many children's stories sort of begin with a loss like Bambi back from my generation, you know, Bambi's mother dies. And, um, and, and I think parents often feel protective of that. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, I can't read Charlotte's web because, you know, Charlotte dies. 
But I, I think that's actually kind of the wrong tack. And there's something helpful about just being matter of fact about yeah. it. But this awareness that we have early on, in some sense, when you're five, it's a it's a pretty hypothetical understanding. But I think I think it also there is a visceral reality that we as as a human body and psyche kind of know what the final what the end game to this is and and how momentous that is to to really wrap our heads around it and and do we ever really and one of the things that comes up for me is uh the the legend of the myth of gilgamesh which is you know the oldest piece of literature that we have and this is a central theme you know gilgamesh has all of these uh adventures uh and he has this friend enkidu and then enkidu dies and this, the whole second half of that myth, which is very profound, you know, Gilgamesh is kind of like a five-year-old. He maybe didn't realize that he was going to die. And he says, shall I not die too? Am I not like Enkidu? I have grown afraid of death, so I roam the steppe. And he goes on a quest to find immortality, and he finds it. But then he <laughs> falls asleep, and while he's asleep, the snake steals it. So uh, it it just it just goes right to something very very basic and essential that that we have this reality that we cannot deny even though we like to try that we will die yeah. and what and and yeah. and really it is the uh, uh, you know it is the final the final mystery isn't it the uh-huh. the um, the territory one cannot visit. Yeah. What what I'm thinking is that some of these other losses are a kind of preparation or rehearsal of, you know, the 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 kid who's off for the weekend to visit grandparents and you forget the teddy bear has has an opportunity to uh somehow come to terms with this loss an absence, a kind of death, uh, and all of the feelings about it. And that hopefully then along the way, uh, we come to terms with the possibility of our own absence from ourselves, uh, that, that, that we call dying and death. And then what will happen to me? Uh, and facing that anxiety, facing that, the uncertainty, you know, we can reassure the child that, you know, two days we'll be back and, and your teddy bear will be there. Other times it's a devastating loss, but, uh, we don't know what happens. Will I just cease to be? Will I be absent from myself? And I think, you know, we displace that uncertainty onto all kinds of life projects uh, that, that, you know, way underneath uh, my ambition to have the proverbial corner office or make a lot of money or, uh, you know, do, do good social justice things in the world. Uh, there are a thousand things uh, is a way of uh, pushing our awareness of death into the background because we're leading a heroic life. Uh, we're engaged and, and you know, we're, we're going to uh, plant new crops on the back 40. We're going to uh, get another degree. We're going to uh, help dedicate the new wing of the hospital. I, there are thousands of things that if I throw myself into life and if I really work hard and if I'm really into it 100%, um, then somehow my passion and energy for life and my achievements uh, will make the inevitable end of things recede way into the background. Well, there's such truth to that, Deb, that if, if we have evidence of our own dynamism, our own vitality, our own capacity mm-hmm. to act and create exactly. and, and to produce and reproduce, 
Um, that's the antithesis of yeah. the decline, the antithesis of the yeah. of the receding into the great dark. Exactly, because we're ascending, and I think there is an essential polarity here of. You know that we're unique and we have consciousness and we have all kinds of wonderful things. And so it's an effort to transcend. And, and in the face of the opposite, which is the ending, uh, the not being. So, and if we can if, transcend, mm -hmm. if we can achieve, we offset the other. Now, if, if we take all of that and we lean a little bit into Jung's work, that um, fear of death and fear of the unconscious and fear of the regression all uh, mixed together as well. And, and one of the strange places that fear of death can service is fear of falling asleep. Mm. Mm. That, that just um, mm -hmm. the loss of consciousness of falling asleep. Um, and and it does, mm. in some ways, uh, partake of that kind of um, death because we think of death as loss of consciousness, loss of self awareness. Yes. When we think of um, often underlying suicidal fantasies, is a return to the great mother. When when we think, when I work with people that have suicidal fantasies, they're often they're so tired, they're so beleaguered, that there's so much strain inside, and and they long for this space where nothing is required, not even breathing, not even eating, not even bathing. Mm. There are no decisions to be made. Every around us is is um, non-confrontive is is safe and easy and one could argue that that's a vestigial memory of being in the womb because when we are a, a fetus we're in the womb we don't eat we don't breathe um, the umbilical mm -hmm. cord takes all of our needs, and, and it's the, the mother, the great yeah. mother's, the mother's body provides everything that's required. And so the retreat into the earth, into the tomb, is much like a retreat into the womb on a fantastical level. Mm. And so, so much of how Jung characterized the human venture is the ego in its heroic stance to fight to be conscious, to not succumb to the collapse into the instinctive, into the unconscious, again, into the womb. And yet at the end of life, that is the longed-for place, to return to the death mother, when we are tired and, and we need renewal, and, and we hope, as in the Eleusinian mysteries, that we go into the cave, yeah. that we go into the underworld, and that something happens, and perhaps there is a return in some way, but that the cycle back into something like the womb is required to reemerge. Excuse my brief interruption. I just want to let you know some ways that you can support us and the podcast. First of all, I'm so thrilled to let you know that my book is now out. It's available in bookstores, The Vital Spark, Reclaim Your Outlaw Energies and Find Your Feminine Fire. So I hope that you will check that out. We have a live podcast recording coming up this Saturday, February 10th. There are free tickets still available as of this recording. You can join us, you can hear more about the book, and you can ask us questions, and we'll even do a dream interpretation for someone in the audience, so please check that out. Um, I want to remind you that you can like and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, these things are all incredibly helpful. You can also become a Patreon subscriber. 
And uh, we produce extra content every week for our patrons. We're very appreciative. And finally, you can check out Dream School, our 12-month online self-paced program where you can learn to work with your dreams. And uh, we're really excited for the book that we have coming up on dream interpretation, which is based on the materials in Dream School. So if you want to get an early start on that, go over to our website and check that out. It's thisunionlife.com and you'll find more about everything there. So thanks. We, we don't know a lot about the Ellicinian uh, mysteries. We know some stuff. But what I'm thinking about is how do we prepare for death? Uh, these mysteries were available to anybody who, sm- who spoke Greek whether you were a you know a peasant or a slave or a nobleman, uh, but the preparation was arduous and it took a year. Uh, and then there were the mysteries uh, underground, and an experience that uh, of a, a, a symbolic death. And it was said that people who could experience the mysteries. Uh, people said they were no longer afraid of death. And today we have a modern equivalent of people who have had near-death experiences. And there are a number of very uh, convincing testimonials by people who have had these experiences and by um, emergency room and other physicians uh, who have been present to resuscitate uh, some, you know, significant number of people who were right, who were uh, declared legally or uh, physically dead, uh, and that those people uh, have an experience from which they return uh, and have a very different orientation and attitude to life uh, because they've had that experience. But in today's world, in the Western world, we don't have those experiences. So, um, you know, I I know I read some stuff, uh, kind of firsthand reports about the Eleusinian mysteries, and I I wish I'd put my hands on it for this episode. But it's 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 you know this is the promise of yeah. the mysteries is that you will no longer need to fear death because you will have died. So and and mm-hmm. death and rebirth is a central theme in almost all rituals of initiation. So yes. that uh, initiation is protective against the fear of death. So when I think about my, you know, younger analyzans struggling with the fear of death, it's perhaps they haven't been initiated. And you're right, Deb, that most mm. people, yeah. one of the common things with uh, people who experience near-death experiences is that they don't, they no longer feel afraid of death. The other thing that's related, and this, we talked about this a few weeks ago, is uh, uh, the use of psychedelics is often used to treat people who are near the end of life. And the findings are that that often alleviates or ameliorates the fear of death, which is the tie-in is that uh, th- there's strong evidence to believe that there was a psychedelic element in the Eleusinian mysteries with the, the Kiki. Yes. Um, but in any case, it's it's this notion that confrontation with the transpersonal uh, can mm-hmm. heal this fear of death. And this is very much what Jung says, that it's contact with the numinous that heals, that we get into an erotic space where we uh, are, are kind of spinning and, and just in anxiety all the time and disconnected from ourselves. And that what pops us out of that is contact with the numinous, whether that's through an experience with psilocybin or through a near-death experience or perhaps a dream or, or just a spontaneous arising in the psyche of something. Um, uh-huh. I, I am interested in, in terms of what you were saying before about the, the mother and it, you know, this is leaning right into Jung's work and to a certain extent Neumann's and, and specifically Jung in volume five. Uh, you know, which is is that the task of the ego is this heroic task of separating from the mother. And uh, I'm just going to read a quote here. 
The libido that is withdrawn so unwillingly from the mother turns into a threatening serpent, symbolizing the fear of death. For the relation to the mother must cease, must die, and this is almost the same as dying oneself. That is to say, the violence of the separation is proportionate to the strength of the bond uniting the son with the mother. And the stronger this broken bond was in the first place, the more dangerous does the mother approach him in the guise of the unconscious. So there's this kind of paradox that when you step out into life, and that's really what he's talking about, separating from the mother. He's not really yeah. talking about a young person moving out from home. It's a psychological <laughs> experience of, of becoming your own person. And that that is so kind of terrifying that the, it's almost like the unconscious comes back to attack you in the form of this fear of death. And you, you have to sort of fight against that if you are to be in life. Yeah. Huh. So a couple of interesting things around the table. One is about uh, perhaps the reports of those who have, who have had near-death experiences or who might actually say they've had death experiences. The other is some of the mystery traditions and what they might communicate and, and how we might make use of that, as well as then the fight to remain conscious in all of its forms. So um, one resource that I've always found interesting is the Monroe Institute. And they're out in Faber, Virginia, outside of Charlottesville. And just a quick interesting story, uh, very similar to what you were saying, Deb, Robert Monroe had um, a near-death experience. He was in a medical crisis. He was apparently medically dead. His body was inactive mm -hmm. for some prolonged period of time. Um, he was revived and had these rather extraordinary experiences of being outside of his body and, and being alert and conscious. And as yeah. he returned and, and tried to integrate this extraordinary experience, one of, of, of the primary values uh, is that he lost his fear of physical death and felt that having yeah. achieved that, his Whole, per whole personality had, had changed. His values had changed, what he thought was important. When he looked out at the world, at mm -hmm. what people seemed to be fighting about, what wars were um, fueled by, so much mm -hmm. of the great human uh, tension seemed to be driven by the fear of death and also the uh, avoidance of anything that might appear to put yeah. the physical body a threat. And so his institute, and now for decades, has tried to induce out-of-body experiences at will. And his yeah. hope is that if the average person, without any religious context, wow. but just as a matter of yeah. learning how to induce certain uh, brainwave states, could experience themselves existing outside of the body and then return to the body, that the primary side effect would be that people would no longer be afraid of death or more correctly have evidence that consciousness survives outside of the physical body. Yeah. So that's one uh, interesting uh, amalgam of this mystical experience and then modern science seeking mm -hmm. to try to grant this experience for, for the benefit that we have been talking about to, to overcome the fear of death and all the implications that that might have for us. Uh, it's a, a great example of how, you know, it, historically, uh, this has been bookended you know, thousands of years ago, there were the Ellicinian Mysteries, and now there's the Monroe yeah. Institute. And that what we're talking about, what you keep bringing us back to, Lisa, is the fear of death. And that if we have the experience of participating in the Ellicinian Mysteries, maybe if we have an experience of uh, psychedelic 
uh, out of body or uh, some sort of altered state. We have the experience uh, that the Monroe Institute facilitates. Now, we don't doubt the experience and the fear is gone, which is uh, different from certainty about, oh, this is what happens afterward. But, mm-hmm. but we don't, we no longer fear it, which is a tremendous blessing and boon. Mm-hmm. Uh, since, uh, as we all know, uh, death is inevitable. You know, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, other things that can be protective against a fear of death. So we've talked about this uh, kind of a numinous experience, but but I think that leaning right into being alive is also important. And and mm-hmm. maybe even just really accepting that uh, death is a kind of Im- important and inevitable part of life, too. I'm going to just pull up this great quote from the Red Book. Jung says, if I accept death, then my tree greens, since dying increases life. If I plunge into the de- if I plunge into the death encompassing the world, then my buds break open. How much our life needs death. And uh, I have seen this in my practice that when you just say, look, death, like you said, Deb, death is inevitable. Let's just let's <laughs> uh, let's get busy living. Um, and and there's uh, you know Jung echoes that also this is a, this is another a young quote it's it's long but it's really rich and there's a lot packed in he says natural life is the nourishing soil of the soul anyone who fails to go along with life remains suspended stiff and rigid in midair that is why so many people get wooden in old age. They look back and cling to the past with a secret fear of death in their hearts. They withdraw from the life process, at least Mm. psychologically, and consequently remain fixed like nostalgic pillars of salt with vivid recollections of youth, but no living relation to the present. From the middle of life onward, only he remains vitally alive who is ready to die with life. For in the secret Mm. hour of life's midday, the parabola is reversed. Death is born. The second half of life does not signify ascent, unfolding, increase, exuberance, but death since the end is its goal. The negation of life's fulfillment is synonymous with the refusal to accept its ending. That's so important. Both mean not wanting to live, and not wanting to live is identical with not wanting to die. Waxing and waning Uh. make one curve. And what I, this notion that when we avoid death, we're also avoiding Uh. life is absolutely borne out in what I see in, in, uh, you know, the lives of my patients. And that the more you embrace death, the more you're able to embrace life. So that is the paradox here. Mm-hmm. What I hear in, in his uh, use of metaphor is the, the strained relationship that we have with the idea of the salutio. And, and so part of his alchemical treatment of the same ideas is that all of life is a cycle of dissolving and recoagulating. Salutio. Mm. coagulatio and that when we resist the dissolving process which is a psycho-spiritual process that we get into this stiffness that in old age as he was saying that there is such a resistance to dissolving which could be the dissolving Mm. of fixed attitudes the dissolving of Mm. uh, certain positions Mm. emotionally that we're all done changing. I'm too old to try that, or I'm too old to try to let go of mm-hmm. something or to, to resolve a certain conflict inside of myself. But the, the resistance to this process of softening and firming up over and over again is part of that both refusal to die, which is the great dissolution, 
but also the refusal to live mm. in as much as life requires mm. this constant rebirth of attitude, mm. this constant mm. renewal of softness and re-engagement. And so mm -hmm. the, the first, you know, salutio is the mother-child ouroboric bliss, where there's a great ocean between the mother and the child, and the child has to constellate out of that and become his own or her own little person. And then there is the second salutio, which is the great falling in love with whoever that mm -hmm. is, and the not mm -hmm. wanting of any boundaries, and the bliss of the salutio of love. And then one has to separate out of that. And, and I, I am in relationship, but I, I am still my own person. And then there's the salutio of initiation, where the self says, in, in order to make room for me, as the voice of the self, that the ego must submit to a releasing of its boundaries, and then a re-coagulating with some of the perspectives of the self, the broader attitudes, the, the widening of the personality. And then once again, there is a, a tightening up, and there at the end of life, death invites the dissolution of the body to go into the great mm -hmm. solution that has no mm -hmm. limits, and in some ways, not necessarily a promise of a recoagulation, right. but one expands infinitely. And as some say, yeah. the, when someone passes away, it, it is that last exhalation, which any of mm. us have seen as we've witnessed the passing of a loved one and the idea that the spirit escapes, the pneuma, the ruach, escapes in the last breath and expands infinitely outward in this great merging with all things, the, the fullest salutio. And so when I was listening to your quote from Jung, I find myself thinking about that and how the stiffening, the refusal to dissolve, at first seems like mm -hmm. I'm refusing death because death is the great dissolving. But mm -hmm. it's in the refusing that we also refuse to grow, because growth requires right, some we, form of dissolving. And we refuse life. And therefore we refuse life. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I like the cyclical nature that you've just mm -hmm. articulated about uh, a series of dissolvings and then reforming, uh, and that this is a cycle of life, and then there is the ultimate salutio called death, and we don't we don't have any guarantees about will there be a recoagulating, uh, a a rebirth, or an afterlife, etc. And of course, uh, many a religion has. Uh, conceived its own notions of what that might look like. But where I um, want to go is that in our collective societal fear of death, people don't have very much experience of it. You, you may sit by the bedside of someone that you've loved dearly in life as, as he or she is dying. But basically, um, we don't talk about it. We don't prepare young people, uh, midlife people, or anyone else, really. We don't prepare for death. We don't talk about it. It's not a subject of conversation. And we kind of outsource it and medicalize it. You know, people go to a hospital or they go to a hospice. Uh, and you know, then the preparation of the body is outsourced to a crematorium or to a mortician. Uh, so there's an underlying collective level of kind of airbrushing mm. the reality of death away 
Whereas, you know, uh, if we could see it, if we could uh, enfold it as part of life, uh, it might be it might be a little different. I know in the Jewish tradition there is a ritual where people wash the body, and uh, this is a dedicated service of that has helped people to to see and to touch a body of one who is deceased, and to see, to accept, to have that experience, uh, rather than the distancing from it that is our collective norm. Now, s- some of it, uh, Deb, I think is, you know, this, this uh, impenetrable mystery, right? Hamlet calls mm-hmm. it the undiscovered exactly. country from whose born no traveler returns. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that it can help us to have a belief mm. about what happens. Of course, we don't know. We, do, we don't, and we, we probably will never know. And in some ways, I hope we never know. Uh, but to have a belief about what happens, whether or not that it's, that, you know, consciousness continues in some way, or we become, we sort of return to great spirit, or we become reincarnated. Um, uh, right. You know, it's the, the, the mystery traditions, the great religions of the world had these stories that told us what happened. And in some cultures, uh, th- these were very elaborately described and worked, like in the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which, Joseph, maybe you can, can uh, say a little bit more about. But, but in our modern era, we are left without really any structuring stories about what happens. And I think that makes it more difficult because then we're just face to face with that, that mystery that, that Hamlet was facing down. And of course, confronting that mystery has been the source of many a great work of art, in, including, of course, that, that mm. famous play from Shakespeare. Well, yes, the, uh, the books of the dead are often the books of initiation. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is said to be the stages that the soul goes through as it absorbs and integrates its life experience and then is weighed and judged and passed on to eternal life or not, that these same mythologies were used for the ritual mysteries of initiation. That um, mm. in the Egyptian magical system, that the initiate would take upon himself the role of Osiris and to be ritualistically entombed for some amount of time and then raised mm. from the sarcophagus as if he was the risen Osiris, having undergone this process. Vestiges of this are still present in the Freemasonic tradition because the third step of the initiation is the raising of the master mason. And to be raised to be Mm. the master mason is to be brought from the death of relative ignorance into this state of uh, symbolic enlightenment. And, And so it is also in the Tibetan Book of the Dead that the soul goes through these various bardos and has various experiences. And if they are negotiated with the right attitude, that the soul can experience a kind of liberation. Those same processes of understanding how to let go and how to orient to these processes is part of meditation traditions in uh, certain schools of Kabbalah. It's thought that when the soul dies, the soul travels up through the various sephiroth or the various worlds in the Merkaba or the sacred chariot and encounters mm. these various aspects of the divine, angelic hierarchies. And so in some schools mm. of Kabbalah, the meditation techniques are said to expose one ritualistically and symbolically to these states of consciousness as mm. well. All of this leading to some sense of understanding 
the life that one has lived in such a way that we can integrate what is best and come to a moral and ethical stance of what we wish we could have done better and might do better Mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. And then that process becomes a gate into a promise that there will come another time to do better, to be closer to perfection in one way or another. Mm -hmm. The Christian tradition has some sense of that, although there is a bit of a bypass that one will come to Christ and Christ will make us Mm -hmm. perfect without any additional process, without any additional educative process. But that is actually one of the few ancient traditions that says that that no work will be required of us Mm -hmm. in order to Mm -hmm. release, retain, or, or achieve, rather, the union with the God, the union with perfection. So if I were to ground that a little bit, yeah. So if I were to ground that a little bit in terms of what what can one do and and where I think Jungian work is so congruent with these ancient traditions is that Going into oneself, whether it's dream analysis or the analysis of one's fantasies, or being interested in the way that we function inside of ourselves, examining our complexes, our thoughts, our reactions, all of this is a way of going into this inner world and seeking to resolve the suffering inside of us that has both an ethical, a behavioral, an emotional, and an attitudinal cause in the hopes that freedom could be attained within us. And for Jung, the freedom is this capacity to most fully express the deepest and one might argue, the divine blueprint that has been apportioned to us, uniquely to us. This is talked about in the Purushas and in the Indian tradition that the self, the Atman, that there is an absolutely unique part of ourselves that is obstructed. And anything that we can do to unobstruct the divine spark inside of us is the path. Mm -hmm. And that the ways we fail to unobstruct that unique divine spark in us is what we will have to confront after death. So why not Mm -hmm. do it now? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Exactly. Over and over again, in all that you've delineated, it seems to me exactly that, that the message is live. Yeah. Live of if, whether you, it, no matter what religious or philosophical tradition uh, y- you may adhere to, or uh, it, there are stages, stages of growth, stages of fulfillment of your own innate potential that Jung called individuation. but. Uh, that if we really live, it seems like this is the idea, if you really live into yourself, into your own potential, uh, uh, try to be self-aware, reflect, uh, then, you know, when it is time to die, to pass on, uh, you, you will have had all those experiences that make, make one less afraid. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we've gone through uh, the losses and uh, of of various life stages and become more, become bigger. But that's it. Do it now. Right. Live. (laughs) Live. Embrace death and embrace life. Yes. 
and so much of that Buddhist tradition of accepting impermanence, just mm-hmm. as you were saying, Lisa, mm-hmm. that accepting the reality of the death of the body. And so that's another delineation I think that's so important is that when we say accepting death, since we don't know what happens to consciousness, then how about if we just take that out of the equation for a moment and entertain the possibility that what we can be certain of is that bodies die. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The body will cease functioning. Bodies stop breathing. Bodies, hearts stop beating. And that we can be absolutely certain that this pelt that we walk around in as I like to call my body, the jalopy. <laughs> I can keep this jalopy going maybe for another X number of years. I'll patch the tires and do whatever I can to keep it rumbling along. But at a certain point, the jalopy is going to break an axle. It's going to throw a rod. It's not going to be repairable. And it's, it's not going to turn the ignition one morning. It just isn't mm. going to we're going to start. But perhaps we are the riders in our jalopies and Mm -hmm. that something else is possible when the jalopy finally won't start one morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that differentiation is something that's very consistent in all the ancient traditions and even Mm -hmm. in most modern religions that to not confuse the jalopy with the spirit. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I I really like your analogy, Joseph. The jalopy <laughs> versus the rider. Uh, it's it's a lovely mm-hmm. thought, and uh, one that has a, some, a certain amount of substantiation uh, in the experiences of people who've had near death experiences. Mm-hmm. But we and we don't know, and that's mm-hmm. part of this last initiation. That just as uh, young people who are, mm-hmm. you know, sort of proverbially dragged out into the desert uh, at night by the elders don't know, uh, we don't know, and that's part of it. So, what I'd like to to challenge because we have a few more minutes, Deb, is that um, okay? I am. I would like to extract the word "we" from that statement. <laughs> okay, because. Some people are very certain that they do know. Yeah, Some yes. people are very certain that they have attained this capacity to, to step outside of the jalopy, wander mm-hmm. through these spiritual worlds, collect objective information, and to return to the jalopy and drive back into the bedroom and, and talk mm-hmm. about it. Now, yeah. perhaps, perhaps the average person could say individually, I have never had that experience. I wonder about other yeah. people. I wonder if there are methods or ex- ways to attain such an experience of what it's like to be free of the jalopy for a period of mm-hmm. time. But, but, I, but I am um, cautious to say that no one can possibly know what comes next. And for those who wish to explore some of this, I would also steer you to the work of Rudolf Steiner, who was an extraordinary German mystic. And Steiner, many people don't realize, but um, he was uh, in some ways the founder of biodynamic farming, which in some ways has been divorced from his mystical observations and become its own scientific endeavor. Rudolf Steiner founded the Waldorf school system And many people don't realize is that Steiner had this capacity to park the jalopy of his body, open the door, and go into these extraordinary states of consciousness and observe child development from these spiritual realms, come back, and then make recommendations for how to educate children based upon Mm -hmm. how their souls seem to develop when he observed them outside of the limits of his body. The same he did with uh, anthroposophic medicine and a number of other different realms. He also wrote on human existence between death and rebirth, which is something that one can can Google. Rudolf Steiner, 
human existence between death and rebirth, and and read through his accounts of the experiences that souls in general seem to occur based on his observation of that, and his report of his own death process. There were those who were with him in those final few hours, and his capacity to be monitoring the shifts of energies in his body, the shifts of consciousness around him. This absolute absence of fear that he experienced, although he was at times in great physical pain. And similar accounts <laughs> from any number of people, both great mystics as well as perhaps ordinary folks who seem to be able to track the transition towards their own death and speak to it even in those last few minutes. And yeah. I think there is more confidence and wisdom that what we call the mystery is known in some fashion, which is why many of the accounts of the journey between death and rebirth seem so consistent beyond traditions and across millennia. And so I'll share that the night before my father died, I had gone to the hospital. He had been delirious um, and restrained for um, about a week, and we were, were unsure how his treatment was going to be going forward. But I went to the hospital to visit him, thinking that he would be discharged from the hospital in a few days. And uh, There was a bit of turbulence there, and he was confused, and finally got him comfortable, and he and I were alone. And... Uh, Finally got him to lay on his side because his back was in a lot of pain, but he couldn't figure that out. So he finally relaxed, his pain subsided, and I put my head down on the pillow next to him, and uh, he took my hands in his hands, and he just gently rubbed them and patted them, and he said to me, I'm going to Jerusalem. I am going to Jerusalem. <laughs> And that's not anything my father had ever said to me and wasn't a particularly religious man. I said, really, Dad? Is that, is that, that's the goal. He goes, absolutely. It's going to happen. Going to Jerusalem. And that night he had uh, passed away from a massive heart attack. But the journey mm. and the enthusiasm yeah. for the journey mm trip to Jerusalem. That's nice. That he was right yeah. on the verge of, and the absolute certainty that he was going. And that he knew yeah. it was a destination, and he happened to call it at that moment, Jerusalem. Well, you know, however we do it, uh, whatever a religious or philosophical tradition we subscribe to, whatever individual experiences we have, it's up to each of us to come to terms with our own journey toward yes. death and how we face it, what we feel, what we believe. Uh, it's an, ultimately an individual journey that each of us yes, has to take. Absolutely. And I think Absolutely. that's a good place for to switch to a dream. Today's dreamer is an 81-year-old woman who is a retired higher education counselor, and she has titled her dream, The House with Hidden Rooms. Mm. I was in a house with hidden rooms. I started to walk through the hidden rooms. The first room was supposed to be a bedroom, but it had a small stream with grass mm. along the banks. It was S-shaped, and it felt like a meditation room. The next room was filled with about nine or 12 people, all standing close together. I could only see their heads and shoulders. They didn't speak. I wondered why they were there in my house. And she notes, I have been a caretaker for my husband of 61 years. 
He has a slow growing cancer. I am healthy and keep active as time allows. And she notes that the main feelings in the dream were curiosity, calmness, and sometimes fear. And she notes that she's had a recurring dream of houses. The houses are located in different locations, sometimes near the ocean, and sometimes on a low hillside. So there's something kind of gentle and and moving, I think, about this image. Yes, yes. Maybe I'll just saunter through the door first and say that (laughs) the theme of a house with hidden rooms is a very, very common theme. Even Jung had that dream. Yes. So it's a, it's usually a very positive dream. I mean, they're they're not always positive. I've I've had versions of that dream that become nightmarish. <laughs> so, but in general, the theme is you're in a house and you're discovering it's your house and you're discovering that there are these rooms you never knew about, which is a very moving image, right? That you're discovering mm-hmm. new aspects of yourself and that that this woman is 81 years old and having that dream is touching. That we can still discover unknown rooms in our psychic house, even in our ninth decade or eighth decade. I think that's the ninth decade. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, hitting a little too close to home for me, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm really sort of uh, seconding what you've just said. Of, and what is a house? You know, uh, a house is, uh, literally, if we just explain what a house is, uh, as if nobody knows, uh, it is a dwelling. It is an edifice that uh, we have had constructed or was constructed. So it requires tools and consciousness and planning and all the things that we associate with ego. So a, a house in a dream is often a symbol for what we've built, what we have constructed uh, through our uh, decades, uh, the dreamer and I, Mm -hmm. our decades of of life. And um, all of a sudden, there's more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And our dream ego starts to walk through the hidden rooms. So there, there is the forward momentum, volition, uh, curiosity, whatever the dream ego might be feeling, but uh, it, she's going forward. Mm-hmm. She doesn't leave the house. She doesn't uh, sit down and have a, a cup of coffee. She goes through the hidden rooms. And here's the first room. It's supposed to be a bedroom, but it had a small stream with grass along the banks. (laughs) Mm. So now we know uh, we we are not in a real world uh, Mm. a house. And I I was struck by that image of that all of a sudden, here's the natural world. Uh, You know, it seems like such a gentle, positive, pleasant, bucolic uh, image. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's this, and it's it's that. S-shaped. I'm not quite sure what to make of S-shaped and felt like a meditation room. Well, I mean, I think the S shape is it's an organic shape, right? It's not it's not mm-hmm. a square. It is it recalls. I mean, it's almost like um where the wild things are, right? Where the where his bedroom uh, becomes an ocean and a forest and so this kind of liminal, it's a liminal space. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. And just, I'm just going to uh, take a step back if people don't know about where the wild things are. It's a children's story about a little boy who's stomping around in the house and his mother uh, sends him to his room. And that's where, uh, as you said, Lisa, in his room, 
he goes to the island of the wild things, which is what his mother has called him. She said, you're a wild thing. Mm -hmm. And so he goes to this imaginal space and he interacts with the wild things and he finally tames them, um, meaning he tames his own instinctual, impulsive, aggressive impulses. So yes, it does feel uh, like time out of time, yeah. an imaginal space, a liminal space. I think that the stream flowing in and out of the room <laughs> uh, portends uh, an awakening in the dreamer that what she claims to be her known life is actually an existential field where impulses flow in and out, and she is the observer but not the generator of the experience. In the uh, tarot card, The Chariot, mm. there is a, a charioteer and a chariot. There's a city and a town in the background, but in the middle of the ground there is a field and there is a stream, a river running in and out of it. And it's assigned the Hebrew letter cheth, which means field. And what it's meant to convey is that at a certain point, human beings have the opportunity to realize that they are actually a space within which events occur, which is very much similar to, I think, what Jung is talking about and he wants us to see the psyche as a field where there are autonomous figures that act independently. The ego is one observing character, but that we are not fully in control of what flows into the psyche and what flows out. Jung also intimated this when he talked about thoughts. Thoughts are like birds. <laughs> they, they land, you try to capture them while they're there, and then they're gone. And they have an autonomous life to themselves. So at 81, here in that last leg of her journey, to be able to depersonalize her psyche as a room that life flows into and flows out of, mm. that she is neither the source of what flows in, nor can she control what flows out and onto whatever journey moves mm. forward. But she is tending the part of the stream that she can observe and that her life experience is added to the stream of life for that time that she abides in that room. Mm. Her thoughts, her feelings, her um, experiences, her philosophy, her realizations are also added to the great stream of life, but that is carried beyond her. And has some ongoing life. Mm -hmm. So I think that as, as strange as it may be, I think it's a very profound image. Mm -hmm. And I hope that she can have a sense of that. The second room with the 12 silent uh, individuals mm -hmm. who are abiding with her. It reminds me a little bit of um, Jung's seven sermons. Yeah. To me, it seems like it is the room of the ancestors, perhaps, the room of those souls, those abiding presences that have ever been with us but not known. Mm -hmm. so they're hidden rooms, but ostensibly they were there all along. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the dream, she begins to say it's not just a house, but they're in my house. Mm -hmm. And that's a transition between the beginning and the end of the dream, which suggests these people have been abiding with her. Yeah. The 12, 12 constellations, yeah. something complete, something transcendent. And I think as part of the great river of life, we also come into a sense that we are part of a river of humanity that has extended back many, many generations. And perhaps if she has children, might extend forward these many generations. 
that she is part of a transcendental community. The river running through it, it is, um, as you've already said, Joseph, it's a beautiful image of the eternal, of what runs through our lives. Our lives run through our lives. Uh, I, I also want to go back to it felt like a meditation room mm -hmm. because that seems to echo. It, it was supposed to be a bedroom. There's a small stream with grass, and uh, it's S-shaped, and it's a meditation room. So they all seem to indicate th these are, this is a space uh, not for egoic activity, um, but it's a different kind of space, uh, a space for psyche, um, a space of mystery. Yeah, we don't really know. I, I also want to add that you mentioned the Seven Sermons of the Dead, which is one, Jung, one of Jung's early uh, sort of visionary uh, uh, experiences where uh, he was uh, almost channeling these contents and he wrote furiously and got all this down. Uh, and it, it's not. Um, it's not discursive uh, k kind of reading at all. And it's in the back of his memoir, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. Uh, I don't know what to make of these nine or 12 people. Uh, she could see only their heads and shoulders, and they didn't speak. So I'm thinking about just the upper part of the body. That's what she has is body image, partial body images, and no words, no sound. Well, so they are kind of silent observers in a way. And I noticed when she mentioned her feelings in the dream, she did mention sometimes fear. And my imagination, which I don't have any way of checking, is that the fear came around the people. That's the part in the dream that feels a little ominous, perhaps, or could feel a little mm -hmm. ominous. I mean, a, a, a beautiful stream with a mossy bank or a grassy bank flowing through the room is, is pretty pleasant, even though I think, as you've articulated so beautifully, Joseph, it has these kind of very deep implications. But the, the, the kind of nine to 12 strangers is, a, is a, perhaps slightly more ominous. So... I think it might be a, a confrontation with something, I'm going to say transpersonal. And both of those numbers are significant. 12, as you've said, Joseph, mm -hmm. is associated with the 12 apostles, for example. Um, but, you know, nine is three groups of three. And, uh, and, and it is, it is a, a number of significance. I'm thinking of the nine members of the Fellowship of the Ring. I've got Tolkien on the brain mm -hmm. a little bit today, maybe. But, but uh, you know, there's other, other important implications with nine as well. So, you know, there's something otherworldly about these figures. They've apparently sort of been there in the house with her all along, uh, or at least for some time. So there, there's, if there's something, there's a bit of a confrontation there with something that is not quite of this world. Mm -hmm. And, and she, it's interesting that she had to walk through the first room into that second room. So it's like the first room is kind of the first mystery. Mm -hmm. But then there's a deeper mystery that awaits in the confrontation with these silent observers, this kind of, uh, this host, if you will. It also seems that she doesn't speak to them, that at this moment she's an observer. She goes into the other room she can only see the heads and shoulders. They don't speak. She's in a state of wonder, of questioning. Mm -hmm. So it seems that there's a, this is an opening salvo. You know, as often mm -hmm. happens in initiations, as the initiate is moved between these very various uh, stations or altars, that the blindfold is lifted just for a second and mm -hmm. then it's put back. So there's a flash. And that's enough. Mm -hmm. And then in progressive initiations, 
the blindfold or the hoodwink comes off and there's more dialogue or more encounters. And this dream has that, just a glimpse and no more, to prepare for something else that's going to come down the line. Mm. I like that. And I would say that if the first preparation was the S-shaped meditation Mm -hmm. room, the psyche's, um, you know, preparing her for whatever this encounter is, you know, with, with kind of generosity and gentleness, you know, because it's, it's, it's a beautiful image, this room. Yeah. You know, and of course, uh, you know, she says in the context that she provides uh, that she, you know, she's had a very, very long marriage of 61 years. And uh, she is now very much in the role of a caretaker. Uh, so I, I wonder if that, you know, a kind of acceptance of her role and keeping active as time allows. Uh, but she has a house with many rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a psychic fact, and uh, there are nine or twelve people who observe, who are present, who are somehow there for this mystery, um, perhaps initiation, as you said, Joseph, of uh, the eternal, and then a preparation for what may lie ahead. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to to be toward the end of one's life and to have one's partner, you know, being ill, even if it's a slow process, of course, one, one might have thoughts of mortality. And uh, that, is, that is a whole other set of unknown rooms. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.